Jonah Goldberg, a prominent conservative intellectual, went out of his way recently to set the record straight. What he wants people to know is that he's definitely no fan of Ayn Rand. And it's outrageous to even think that he might be. What prompted this? He received questions about the issue after an episode of the FX drama Impeachment depicted his apartment as including a poster of the cover of Atlas Shrugged. What are Goldberg's reasons for disavowing Ayn Rand? And what does his statement reveal about the conservative movement broadly? And how does this relate to Whitaker Chambers' infamous smear of Atlas Shrugged in the pages of National Review? Welcome to New Ideal, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm Ilan Jerno, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Ankar Gatte. Welcome, Ankar. Hi, Ilan. We're going to discuss the philosophic meaning behind Jonah Goldberg's insistent rejection of Ayn Rand. And before we get to that, I thought it'd be useful to spend just a, a quick uh, moment here telling people who is Goldberg and why his comments matter, because I don't think everybody uh, listening is maybe aware of who he is and why this is significant. So if you haven't heard about him before, you should know that Jonah Goldberg is a journalist, an author, a columnist. He is involved in the Dispatch, a new newsletter publication, and he's a podcaster. Now, he has affiliations with a lot of organizations. One of them is the American Enterprise Institute, a major DC think tank. And this is, and this is an important part of his story. He was a former editor, and he's still connected to National Review, which is a major organ of uh, the conservative movement in the United States. And I think his connection to National Review is part of why this matters. He is, I think, central to the conservative movement in the United States. He speaks for a significant portion of people uh, who share his views. And arguably, just thinking of him as an intellectual, I, I think it's arguable that he's a, he's a bit smarter and more articulate and less tribal than many people in, who are prominent in conservatism today. So there's reason to pay attention to what he's saying. And I, I just want to uh, draw out that Obviously, he doesn't speak for every last person who thinks of themselves as a conservative. That wouldn't follow. But he definitely represents a salient perspective on Ayn Rand within the movement. That's part of why I thought it would be useful to talk about him and his and just comment on his response to her. And I think what's interesting, in as we'll play some clips from his podcast where he talks about this, what's interesting is that he's enforcing a red line. And I think whenever intellectuals do something like this, it signals what their values are and what, what they regard as important. And in this case, he's speaking as an intellectual within a movement and enforcing a, sort of a gatekeeper function of saying, this is permitted inside, this is, permit, this is not permitted. And I think this is, uh, it offers a window on the conservative movement today. And, and, and by, that, by extension, today's culture. Did you want to add anything to that, Ankar? The that you're saying that provides a window into the movement. I think that's important. You said that he doesn't speak for everybody who calls them sort of a conservative. He doesn't speak for everyone in the conservative movement. But on the other hand, as you said, he's drawing a red line. And it's interesting when you when we're going to play a little bit of what he has to say, how much pushback does he get? So it's one thing to say, well, you don't speak for everyone in the movement, but how much disagreement is actually voiced in the movement about this? And I think it's pretty little. So he, it, you can't say, yeah, he speaks for everybody. But on the other hand, the fact that he, there's not a lot of pushback tells you something significant about the movement. Yeah. And as we'll see, the, we'll play it a clip in just a moment. Part of what led him to, to speak about this topic is he got peppered with questions. How could this be? How do you have a poster of Atlas Shrugged in your apartment? So let's play the first clip and just get a flavor of how he approaches this issue. I went into the office and uh, Caleb said, so is it true? And I'm like, what? And he says, is it true that you have an um, Atlas Shrugged Ayn Rand poster on your wall? And, you know, I was seconds from turning my car keys into some sort of fist weapon and gouging out as Adam's apple for the accusation. And then he explained that um, apparently on that, that Clinton scandal, true crime, American crime story thing on FX or Hulu or whatever, um, they had a scene in my old apartment in Adams Morgan um, 
where Michael is off from Newsweek and my mom and Linda Tripp have this conversation, yada, yada, yada. And in the background, there is a big, I've met people who now sent me screen grabs of it. There's a big ass poster f- of the, like the Atlas shrugged, um, book cover or, you know, that it's kind of amazing how objectivist art is so close to Soviet realist art. Um, but whatever, uh, on the wall of what was supposed to be my apartment. Now I could get angry or objectionable or, or dyspeptic or whatever word I'm trying to come up with that is, um, correct for this moment. This Ayn Rand thing. I mean, like clearly they have not done their homework about me. Um, I am not a Randian. I am not an objectivist. I, you know, I've become more libertarian over time, but I am not, um, um, I'm definitely not an objectivist and, um, uh, this assumption that because I was a young conservative in the 1990s, that I was also a Rand worshiper, um, is just, it's just outrageous. And, um, I'd sue for damages, but I don't think I can show damages. Um, all right. So since I'm talking about Rand, uh, why don't, I explain why I'm not a Randian for two seconds and that maybe will be a way I can figure out how to um, segue into talking about the George Will stuff from earlier this week. Um, um, again, I'm, I'm fairly libertarian, you know, even, even before I started becoming more libertarian, which has been a long process. Um, I, I always used to say at the federal level, I'm very libertarian at the state level. I'm, a little libertarian and at the local level, I'm not very libertarian at all at the local level and really at the, and certainly at the family level, I'm a communitarian. Um, uh, one of the core insights of whether you want to call it subsidiarity or localism or federalism, um, um, and even family values is this just basic notion that, um, the, the smaller the unit of, uh, life, um, the more social solidarity, the more right people have to sort of impose norms, to live, uh, adhere to traditions and all of that kind of thing. Um, because the closer you are to the individual or the family, uh, the more consensus there is around those things. And, uh, you know, this is a rich and long topic or a short and quick topic. Um, So that gives you a good flavor of what he has to say. And you can listen to the podcast if you want to get the whole story. There's not much more. We'll play a couple more clips from what he has to say. Just a couple of quick observations before we dig in deeper. You, you just mentioned, Ankar, the point about the, the pushback. I think the pushback he gets is not that he is objecting to Ayn Rand. It's that he might be someone who likes her. And so this is part. So listening to this again now, what I'm picking up is that a big I think a part of the motivation is he's speaking to people who follow him and who are admirers of his and reassuring them. So it's not for the general public. It's not someone off the street might confuse him with being a follower or interested in Ayn Rand's ideas. It's don't worry, my fellow conservatives. I'm not that crazy in effect. That's, I think that's the gist of sort of the motivation behind this. And there's one other thought before I hand it back to you. It's interesting that he's spending what, whatever it is, a few minutes talking about this. No arguments have come up yet. Not she argues for X and I disagree with her for the reasons that I, you know, I, I don't think her premises are right. I don't think her conclusion is right. I don't think the logic's right. None of that has come up. And I, and I don't really see any of that. Uh, it, it's not a, it doesn't seem yet like a substantive objection to what she has to say. Or, and, and it's notable that he regards himself as having drifted more towards what he, he describes as libertarian views. Now, Ayn Rand was not a libertarian, of course, but that's how many people think of her. So in a certain way, he seems sympathetic to the direction that she was heading in, and yet he's not given us any reasons for why he thinks this is an, out, an outrage to classify him as someone who might be interested in Ayn Rand's ideas. It's interesting how adamant he is that I find it doubtful that what really went through his mind is that he wanted to turn his car keys into a weapon and smash the guy's Adam apple. But that's how he puts it because he's trying to distance himself. And it's just having a poster up in supposedly, I mean, according to the, the 
film. Having a poster of Atlas Shrugged up. I mean, having a poster of a book up doesn't mean you agree with everything the author says, and so it doesn't mean you're an objectivist. No one could take it like that. So he, yeah, I think for sure he's trying to go out of his way to say there's no connection at all between me and Ayn Rand and even more broadly the conservatives and this idea that someone might think that it's Ayn Rand who brought people into thinking that there's something good about capitalism and American uh, system of government and economic system. She is the biggest draw for that in the 20th century. I think there's no question about that, that the Fountainhead, At the Shrugged, and her other works are, if you had to take one author and one thinker who's brought capitalism back into the discussion and made it at least somewhat respectable, still attacked, often if you say you're a capitalist, it's Ayn Rand. So th this idea that it's crazy to think someone might have been brought into thinking favorably about capitalism by Ayn Rand, it's it really is going out of his way to say, I've got no connection at all. And it's true, there's no, what we just heard, there's no argument, but you get a flavor of what's to come. And we'll play a few, a couple other clips. The, the describing it, it's, it, he doesn't ever use the word freedom in what we just, but it's sort of, yeah, freedom's tolerable at the federal level and it's tolerable at the state level. But when we get to the local level, no. And he uses the terminology that at that level, you can impose your norms on people. You can impose your beliefs on people. That's the opposite of freedom, that you're imposing really means in the end you're coercively imposing. And that is, I think, part of the whole world view that you get in conservatism. So it has actually, in the end, nothing to do with freedom. So he's caught, I think, between, in some sense, when he thinks of himself as more libertarian, it's something to do with freedom. But when you get to rock bottom, I'm not about freedom and conservatism. It's not about freedom. And that's interesting. Um, and it, there's a deep reason, I think, for why there is that perspective. So in a certain way, the filmmakers were more on point in their assumption that he would have had a poster of Atlas Shrugged, given who he was in the 1990s and, uh, you know, a young conservative writer and so on. And yet, uh, and I think that's part of what you're saying he's chafing at, that, that this whole idea that Ayn Rand attracts people to capitalism. Uh, and I take your point that he's, he thinks of himself in some qualified sense as interested in libertarian perspectives, but up to a certain point, the, the one thing I want to flag, so I don't want this to be just a reaction conversation, because there's so much to react to. But the one one thing that I, I just in terms of his attitude, and the, the tone of this, so I, I mean, I've read some of his works, and I get that part of his style is to be uh, facetious and, and just weird jokes and, and pop culture references. And uh, it's hard to tell when he's being serious and when he's not. This is sort of a, a layer of sarcasm in what he does. But I, but when I hear things like, I'm not a Rand worshiper. So is there no way in which someone can look at the ideas of a philosopher such as Ayn Rand and think, there's interesting things here. Is there no sense in which you can do that without being worshipful? In other words, accepting on, on faith as dogma. So it, it, are those really the only categories? It's completely dissociate yourself or you're a worshiper of that particular intellectual figure. And I don't, I, it would be interesting to think, are there conservatives who think of themselves as worshiping Edmund Burke as an intellectual? I don't think they think of it that way. So there's a kind of contempt that is seeping in here that just is, it's, He's protesting too much, to, to use that expression. There's something here that he's really uncomfortable with. And just his, I don't want to read too much into this, but the, the, how do you actually think of ideas if your assumption is you're either a worshiper of somebody or you're completely dissociated from them? I mean, that seems like a, I don't want to build that up into too much of a dichotomy, but it seems like that's how he's wanting it to be set up. And we should go on to play the next clip, but it, what you just brought up, one possible answer is, this is how a religious person views the world and views ideas. 
or so-called ideas. And that is part of what surfaces in his, in his rejection of Rand. Okay, so that was the, the setup and his two seconds uh, promise of explaining why he's not a, a Randian in his words. So let's go to the next clip. This is going to be, I think, more revealing of what it is that he's objecting to, why he's so adamant and insistent on dissociating himself from Ayn Rand's ideas. Let's play uh, the next clip. I'm not, a, I'm not a Randian. And I do think, however, that the... I, I go back and forth about this. The you know the National Review famously um, uh, under Bill Buckley's leadership basically defenestrated the Randians from the um, mainstream American conservative movement. And there are a bunch of different reasons about it, reason for it. Um, the most famous sort of exposition on this came from Whitaker Chambers, who we talk about. Um, Whitaker Chambers wrote this review, I guess it was of Atlas Shrugged, um, or maybe it was, yeah, I, guess, I think it was of Atlas Shrugged, um, uh, about Ayn Rand, and the real point of it was, as the, the sort of conventional language goes, was to read um, the Randians and Ayn Rand out of the conservative movement. And there's this very famous line in there where Chambers writes something along the lines of, on page after page, wafts up a single message or something like that. Um, wafts up a single message to the gas chamber. Go, and I've always thought that that line, at least, was unfair of 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 Chambers. Um, but the you know the the way the Randians kind of uh, have contempt for religion, contempt for tradition, contempt for all sorts of bourgeois norms and expectations of how to behave in a civil society, I do think that they don't belong in mainstream conservatism. This is a lot there. Uh, two threads I think are worth pulling out here. One is the Whitaker Chambers article. We should talk a bit about that. And the other one, the main reason he objects is that in his view, Rand has contempt for religion, and if you have contempt for religion, you can't be part of conservatism. So that's the red line issue. Uh, let, let's come back to that. Uh, let's start with the issue, the Whitaker Chambers article. So for people who, as you mentioned, uh, this is an article, a review in 1957, soon after Adler Shrugged is published in National Review. And just to fill in some of the context, it's important to get National Review was seen as and as it is today, but it, perhaps more so because the media landscape was different. It was a significant organ for intellectual commentary from the conservative movement. And conservative back then was more associated with freedom than it is today, I think, in people's minds. And so here is an opportunity for this publication to review a book that I think is it's fundamentally groundbreaking in many ways. It's a philosophic book. It's a, a riveting story, and, and it, it, you'd wonder um, what would they think of this. And so, um, Ankar, just fill in for us, who was Whitaker Chambers, and uh, maybe give us a sense of what you think of his article, and what is his central claim? He was a communist who then repudiated communism and turned towards supposedly an advocate of freer markets, and then was writing for the National Review. The, rev the, the review of Atlas Shrugged is not a review. It is, so a book review, if you think of a book review, you're trying to tell readers what is in the book. You give some of your evaluation of it, but it, if you're not conveying what is in the book, it's not a review. And the, this review does not convey what Atlas Shrugged is about. It's his reaction to Atlas Shrugged, and I think it's very revealing from that perspective. And he's taking it as this is how all conservatives should react to Atlas Shrugged. And I think it is the way Buckley reacted to Atlas Shrugged. And that trying to read Ayn Rand out of the conservative movement or that we have nothing to do with her is, I think, to think of what National Review at the time is doing. So you said conservatives or at that time thought of as more on the side of 
free markets and capitalism than they are now. And I think what National Review was doing is partly trying to define what conservatism is as an ideology. Like, what do we really stand for? And what they're trying to do is say the essence of what we stand for in defending any aspect or vestige of freedom and capitalism is religion. Like that's essential to us. And if you reject religion and the kind of religion, both ideologically and as a cultural phenomenon, and this has to do with its its tradition bound, it looks to the past, not the future. What was good enough for our grandfathers is good enough for us. That's very much a religious mentality. Even if it's not official doctrine, it's we go by what was done before without questioning it. That is, the, they want to get that that's what it means to be a conservative. And Ayn Rand is so not that. And she's challenging all of that in Atlas Shrugged. So the, the response, as I say, it's not a review of the novel. It's uh, a reaction. And I think in the end, and this really leapt out at me reading it this time, it's a reaction of fear. It's she's attacking the things that we um, think are sacrosanct. It's what we really respect. And she's giving arguments. And that's scary to them. And to the, the whole edifice of if you're going to rest things on religion, what you're saying is the essence of a religion is accepting doctrines on faith. It's saying, I don't got evidence for this. I don't have arguments for this, but I'm going to believe it anyway. I'm going to accept it anyway. And someone who comes along, and I, Ayn Rand was the same, look, there's no arguments here. There's something really wrong with the whole religious worldview, and there's something better than it. Um, that creates a real opponent that you have to try to knock down. So I think, so part of the fear is that she's going to attract people away from them um, because she's saying, look, your choice is to be on the side of reason and freedom or on the side of religion or more broadly mysticism and force and governmental force and statism. She's telling people that's your choice. And what the National Review wants is somehow that you can be on the side of unreason, so on faith, mysticism, and freedom. And Ayn Rand says there is no such thing. And that is that is what they're reacting to and trying to distance themselves from. And it, it so it's a very philosophical, in that sense, it's a very philosophical reaction. And we can talk about some of the content in the review that really reveals this. Yeah, I think But I think that's what's talk- going on. Yeah, I think we should talk a bit more about the content of the review. My so I reread it again in preparation for our conversation today, and one thing that struck me, and I think this goes to your point about it's a goal of this article, this non-review, is to warn people off Atlas Shrugged. You're not supposed to like this. Don't keep it away. Shun it. We we don't want this as part of what we're about is that a, a, a claim that Chambers makes in this article is that Ayn Rand has to be a materialist, which means in a philosophic sense that there is no, con, there's no reality to uh, an inner life or spiritual uh, co- consciousness in effect. It's, we're just, we're just uh, material beings, we're flesh and blood. And that is... And he drives this point over and over again. And I think it's, there's two points I, I, that uh, came out of that for me. One is for people reading National Review, this is, it's not quite a dog whistle, but it's it's a way of saying, oh, she's with the other materialists, like the, the Marxists. And he does associate her in certain ways with Marxism. Um, so there, we know that that's bad because we believe in, in the spiritual life. We believe in, the, uh, in, in that side of things. And the other point that comes out of it is that it's completely false. I mean, it's, it's, it's dishonestly false. Uh, if for anyone who's read Atlas Shrugged, th- there is no sense in which you can come away from it 
with your mind active and reading, not just glancing at the words, thinking that Ayn Rand disparages consciousness or the mind or, or our, our inner life, different ways you can put the point, and that she elevates and, and thinks that we're exclusively material beings. That is exactly not true. I mean, it, it runs against her theme that the mind is central in human life. The rational mind, reason, is central in creating values. But I think in, to your point that it's it's not a review, he's not really looking at what's in the book. It's it, He's projecting things into it that are not there and things that he thinks have to be there for him to dislike it. It Another thing that struck me in rereading it is... If a high school student gave me this as a book review, I'd fail it. And not because I disagree that, that it, they don't like the book. It can't even get the characters' names right. It can't. And I looked back. So National Review has periodically republished this because they view it as something significant about what National Review stands for and its op position. To Ayn Rand. And I looked at when it, even when it's republished, they can't get the names of the characters right. And that there's editing that goes on at National Review. And if you if this if it's this shoddy in just at that concrete factual level, it's you're not even trying to give a review. You're, there's no real fact check. This is a statement about we are disassociating ourselves from Ayn Rand, not here's a review of Atlas Shrugged, and the materialism that is central to what he's objecting to, but it's very interesting to get what the materialism, what that actually means for him. It So another thing that struck me on rereading this is how anti-American it is. So how anti-America the conservative movement was moving towards at this point and it I think it continued in that way and how anti-American Buckley is because he's so not only published this but has republished it he wrote a kind of snarky obituary when Ayn Rand died um, in which he references the review again so he's not ashamed of it including that like at the simplest factual level it's wrong that so so he's on the side of this review and the materialism is not the idea that there's no place for the mind or consciousness what materialism means is there's a focus on this world and this life and that you view this world and this life so human existence in the here and now you think of it as non-tragic that is putting it differently and in the more American terms, you think of it as the pursuit of happiness is good, possible, and if we live in freedom, will become actual. That so that you can achieve happiness on Earth, and this is part of um, what Chambers is really objecting to. Here's a little bit from um, what he says in the review, and he, so this is he's criticizing Rand's view that on her view, quote man's fate ceases to be tragic at all. Tragedy is bypassed by the pursuit of happiness. Henceforth, man's fate without God is up to him and him alone. His happiness lies within his own workday hands and ingenious brain. His happiness becomes, in Miss Rand's words, quote, the moral purpose of his life. Close quote. And that's actually got something right from Atlas Shrugged. That is something said in Atlas Shrugged. And this is what he's really objecting to. That thinking of, that life is about the pursuit of happiness. And the innovation in the American approach to government, but more broadly to life, is, in from the Declaration, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It was the first time in the history of the world that they thought it's good to pursue your own individual happiness and it's possible to succeed at that. And this Chambers character, it characterizes as it will degenerate and has to degenerate into the pursuit of mindless pleasure. And so, 
So his image is like a Washington, a Jefferson, a Franklin, an Adams, a Madison. These people who are, I think, what it looks like in the American context to pursue happiness. These people, there's something wrong and degenerate about that. They're just pleasure seekers and so on. That's his whole way of looking at the world. And that is so anti-American. It's, it's hard to fathom how anti-American it is. And that's what he's object that Ayn Rand takes seriously, the pursuit of happiness in this world. And in that sense, she's taking seriously the whole American revolution. This is what he's objecting to. It's, it's surprising, I suppose, maybe not surprising, but it's this is coming from an organ, a, a publication that touts the an emphasis on tradition and the founding fathers are so central to many of the ways conservatives talk about this. So it, it, if that has any meaning, then it's empty of philosophic meaning for them because it's, it's tradition as tradition, not because the, what the founders stood for is a pursuit of happiness. So there's sort of a, a superficiality to the embrace of the founders in, if this is how you think of them, uh, that, What's what's objectionable in Rand is that she takes the essence of what was good about the founding era, uh, and you don't like that. So what is it you do like about the founding, except that it was a long time ago and they were people we look up to? Yeah, it, it and it is they posture as they're pro America and pro American, but it really is what you said. It's just. Well, now we can say we're on the side of the founding fathers because they were 200 plus years ago. So now it's about the old and the traditional. If you have any political figures in the history of civilization who are not looking to tradition, but trying to do something new, it's the founding fathers. And the idea that, oh yeah, what they're about is going, they just look to the past and let's emulate the past and what was good enough for our grandfathers was good, is good enough for us. That is just, it's a mockery of them to portray them like that. But yet that is how the conservatives, yeah, we want to go back to the founding fathers just as they went back to the their ancestors and so on. Um, that it's not just not taking America seriously. It's a revolt against what is good about America. I wanted to mention here that, I mean, we might say a bit more about the Chambers article. For people who want to look into it more, you can find it. It's uh, still published, as you mentioned, they keep republishing it. And if you're interested in commentary, detailed commentary about it, there are two things I would uh, suggest that you can look up. In a book called Essays on Atlas, Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, edited by Robert Mayhew, there are two items in there that are relevant for this. One is uh, an essay by uh, Michael Berliner, which looks at reviews of Atlas Shrugged, and, and the Chambers one figures prominently in that essay. And the other uh, item in that book is a, uh, a letter that Leonard Peikoff, who was a longtime associate of Ayn Rand, uh, wrote to National Review in protest against this. And I think the idea was that they would publish it as they do many letters in the, in the publication, like a letter to the editor. It's, it's substantive, it's long, it's detailed. It's, it's an excellent analysis of all the ways in which, or many of the ways in which the Chambers piece is just outright dishonest and, and uh, malpractice as journalism. And it wasn't published in National Review, which I think is itself telling. They did publish letters in protest and in support of Rand, but they did not publish this one. It is included, however, in the book that I mentioned, Essays on Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, uh, edited by Rob Mayhew. So that I, I think I, I recently reread that, uh, and it was it was interesting, and I can see why they chose not to to publish it among the letters that they did, and the ones that they did publish were, I mean I don't think they cut to the core of what the issue was about. So, um, so that's a reference for people who are interested to, to look more into that. So, let's let's uh, unless you wanted to add anything else about Chambers, I wanted to go to the next issue. Go on. Yeah, I, I want to say one other important thing, and it will connect it to the next issue. Um, what also became crystal clear to me on rereading it this time, it's it's the line that is often quoted, and it's the, the one thing that Goldberg says, well, this might be going a little too far. So it, it's the line near the end of the review. Uh, I'll read the sentence. It's, 
So quoting from Chambers Review, quote, from almost any page of Atlas Shrugged, a voice can be heard from painful necessity commanding to a gas chamber go. So this is in 1957. It's obviously echoing the what happened in Nazi Germany. It is, so even conservatives like Goldberg can get, yeah, there's something really unfair about that. That is not what Ayn Rand is saying in Atlas Shrugged. It's indeed the opposite of what she is saying. If there was ever an opponent of communism and fascism, it's Ayn Rand. So it, this is, um, I mean, to call it shoddy journalism is a compliment. I mean, it is an outright dishonest smear. But it tells you something very significant, I think, about Chambers and about this world view. So Chambers switched from communism to religion. That's a switch from authorities. It's I've got the authorities of Marx and Engel and Lenin and, and OK, I don't like them anymore. What authority is going to tell me what to do? That the whole way of looking at the world is saturated like this that it's it's about authorities telling you what to do it. So part of his his reaction to Atlas Shrugged is what it's going to do is set up, a, he puts it something like a technocratic elite. It's going to set up other authorities telling us what to do. And if you think of it from that perspective, what he's responding to is Ayn Rand is telling him that reason and faith are not compatible. And you have to choose between that. And he experiences like that as you're telling me to give up what I hold as dear. And that's like marching me to a gas chamber. And it is true that in what you get in Atlas Shrugged is you cannot compromise between reason and faith, or reason and unreason. There's no middle ground. And the choice is to go fully by reason or to be, and to surrender your life and to surrender the world to the forces of unreason. And that's what they don't want to face. They don't want to face that it's an either or. They want it that we can have both somehow. And part of the message of Atlas Shrugged is, no, you can't. And that is, if you're in this worldview, it's enormously frightening. And that's part of the fear. It's you're telling me I have to choose between reason and faith. I don't want to choose. I don't want to belabor the point about that line, because it, but it's the one line that keeps cropping up. And it seems like it's a favorite touchstone for conservatives when they want a quick dig at Ayn Rand they'll quote they'll resurface this the chambers piece I've seen this a number of times and it's a it's a a uh, sort of off-the-shelf way of I don't have to know anything about Ayn Rand chambers dealt with this for me I'm going to just mention it here and, and smash uh, that uh, value to this is a minor point but I, I think it's important to stress so this is 1957 this is barely a decade since the end of World War II. And, and the, the knowledge about what was happening in Nazi Germany was sort of starting to become better known, widely known. And you're, the, there was many more people alive who had survived the Nazis and who had fled the Nazi horrors. And to, you know, people are, uh, you know, they blithely invoke Nazism today in a way that it doesn't fully take, doesn't even come close to taking seriously the evil that it represents. And the same is true with communism. Like, there's no sense of how evil communism was. But to do that in the shadow of, of World War II, so soon after it, it, it to me it reveals a real uh, contempt for Ayn Rand that is, it, it goes beyond anything reasonable that you might say, oh, I disagree with her. This is a real, uh, there's a viciousness to it. And because I think when people read that in 1957, that hit them like a sledgehammer. It's not, it's not like, oh, yes, gas chambers and people can, be, can talk about it with the, the distance has faded the reality of how horror, how horrific that was and what evil there was. But in 1957, 
that was such a much more of a, an alive context. And to, it, to associate Rand with that is, I mean, it, this is one of the aspects that just is so dishonest. Like, there's nothing in Adler Shrugged. So I, I take your point about this is the reactive aspect of it. And it's his sort of more of an emotional readout. But to suggest that there's anything like this, just concretely, in the, like, this is not what the book is about. Uh, and it, again, it, it brings back this point that there's a real desperation to ward people off, to scare them away from this. Uh, and, and to even to the to go stooping to this level, I think reveals just how desperate that was. Yeah. So we've talked a bit about Chambers, and I think that one of the things that comes out of that is the centrality of of religion in him in his outlook. And I think he, he's representative of a significant number of conservatives at the time and since. So why don't we talk more about this issue of that Goldberg is is enforcing? He's enforcing this red line, is, which, if you, as he puts it, if you, you can't have respect for religion. That's a problem. And l let's hear more from Goldberg in the next clip because I think he goes more into this issue of why he's enforcing this red line and his view of it. Um. But um, uh, you know, Bill Buckley. He explained, and at some point I'll remember where, um, and I, I mean, I've heard him explain it in interviews, but he wrote about it somewhere. I'll figure it out. Um, maybe it was his note in, in uh, have you ever seen a dream walking? But I, I can't remember. Anyway, um, he said, you know, the reason why Ayn Rand wasn't part of the conservative movement or the right or whatever the right terminology was um, was that he said, you, look, you don't have to be religious, never mind orthodox, never mind a Catholic, never mind a Christian to be a conservative. But um, you have to have respect for religion and respect for the religious. And you have to have a certain amount of reverence for notions of the transcendent, even if they don't do much for you personally. And some people think this is a sort of cynical thing. Um, I've heard it argued about on from atheists to, to the Orthodox. Um, I agree with, with Buckley. Um, I think that you have to have an appreciation for the positive aspects of religion, the positive wellspring, you know, what, the, what, what, the, what religion provides for humanity, um, particularly correct you know, I, I don't want to get into it, like what's a correct religious view versus an incorrect religious view or any of that kind of stuff. This is not going to get into theology, but you have to be, um, you have to have a certain amount of reverence or respect and for both religion and the religious. And, um, and if you have contempt for them, then you're just not going to play well with, you know, mainstream conservatives. So again, there's, there's a number of things to comment on here, but I thought it'd be useful just to set context of what was Ayn Rand's actual view of religion? What, how much is what he's describing accurate? Is there contempt? Is it really that, uh, how does she think of it? So let me hand that off to you, Alkar. You have to distinguish what historical period you're talking about. So if, one puts it so um, starkly as just Ayn Rand had contempt for religion. I don't think that is true. So one thing that she says about religion is that it was an early primitive attempt to make sense of the world. In that way, it's a precursor of philosophy. It's trying to give you a worldview that's telling you this is the, the nature of the world you inhabit, this is your nature, therefore this is what you should do. Those are the questions that a religion, when we're talking about like a world religion, that is what the questions it's trying to give answers to. That is what a philosophy is trying to give answers to. To say it's an early primitive attempt, it means it's in the context where people don't really understand yet 
and they're not in kind of conscious control of their thinking and have a distinction between rational ways of proceeding and non-rational ways. So it's, it's they see a ship lost at sea and it's, oh, the seas were angry and there's a God of the sea who was angry and that's why there was a massive storm and the ship is lost and so and there's not a distinction yet really between okay yeah but you're just making stuff up you don't really know this like what's your evidence for this and so it's just like this seems like an explanation that helps us make sense of things when human beings graduated to the point of reaching reason and reason is a self-conscious process of thinking that there's such things as evidence, arguments, good arguments that lead to conclusions, bad arguments that are fallacies and we have to avoid and so on. When we reach the stage of reason, what we part of what that really means to reach that is to, okay, now we need a worldview that we can actually defend. That is that we can say, here's the evidence for it. Here's what you should think. This is the nature of the world. This is your nature. This is what you should do in the world. So you graduate from from religion to philosophy. And philosophy is, as I say, it's the same kind of question that religion is trying to answer. But now that you bar at the door, you can't bring in faith here. You can't just make stuff up. You need evidence and arguments for why this is the right worldview to adopt. And in that context, then to try to resurrect religion, and say, oh no, we don't need arguments, we don't need evidence, we've got faith, we're going by what we feel. Um, you're, you're now, in effect, you're rejecting reason. If you want to now put philosophy and religion on par, or reason and faith on par, and say, no, you go by evidence and arguments, but here I want to, no, I want to just go by whatever strikes me as right, I want to go by what I feel, I want to go by faith. That is, I don't want to be to put it some of the ways it will be put, I don't want the straitjacket of reason and logic. Then that's a rebellion against knowledge and against reality in the end. And Ayn Rand has a very negative view of that. So it's true, but by, in At the Shrugged, there's a condemnation of mystics. And both the, the old, she viewed communists as, as, modern mystics, she calls them mystics of muscle, they think economic forces and the body and muscle labor, that explains everything. Um, and the mystics of spirit who posit supernatural things that explain everything. Both are anti-reason, anti-science, anti-logic. And that she is condemning. So there's a big difference between if you take some primitive person and you say, well, he's got religious ideas. No and taking a modern person after the scientific re revolution, after the enlightenment saying, yeah, we need religion or let's go back to religion. She has a very different attitude towards those two. I want to bring out another point here, which is there's an equivocation in what Goldberg is talking about here, which is you can have uh, this idea of respect for religion and th does he mean in people's private lives should they be left free to worship or not worship what they wish that i think is con consonant with the idea of intellectual freedom and i think she was in favor of that she's on record as saying that but does it mean that you respect the the fact that they as a policy put superstition above reason and i think no i don't i don't respect that i don't see how you could given what we know about the way to knowledge and what it takes to gain knowledge about the world. So, it, it, the, and I think there's a, the reason I'm emphasizing this or bringing this point out is there's a kind of story that pe people have been telling themselves, pe religious people have been telling themselves uh, within conservatism for at least a decade, if not more, so they are bes they're besieged and put upon and that they are persecuted for their religion. And I don't think, that's a reality. I think that there's just a sense of, I don't I put aside what leads to it, but I don't think that's, a, that's true. But I think there's a sense in which the, the, the desire to have respect for religion is bringing that up. I think it's activating that for the audience that he's speaking to. And the, uh, he, it's sort of, in a way, appeasing that mentality, appeasing their, their view that we people of faith 
deserve respect? The answer is nobody deserves respect except for what they've earned. And I think if you're a decent human being, one respects you for those aspects of what you do and have chosen to do that are good, not for the things that are not good. And I think uh, that's important. And it gets blurred here in the way that he's approaching this. And I think it's, yeah. it's it, he wants to put her in the category of, so, so, let me just rephrase this point a different, uh, another way. Uh, I think if you take seriously that he's speaking to that narrative of we're people of faith are put upon that they deserve respect they don't get it and she doesn't have respect for religion he's putting her in a camp that those that audience can easily recognize and can easily decide oh yeah she's not a, she's not with us she has respect, disrespect for us she's against us completely detached from what her actual views were and what one what any reasonable view might be in terms of how to think about religion in a person's life in, in society and, and uh, all the detailed questions that that brings up. So there's a kind of uh, pigeonholing her with respect to his audience. And it's deliberate. It, at least that's my view. It's deliberate that it is because what they really want is don't dare criticize me when I want to not go by reason, when I want to accept things, yeah, I don't have an argument for them. I, I can't give you evidence for them, but I still want to accept them. And so this is the point, like he, he said, I have atheist friends and it, I'm not saying you can't be part of the movement, but don't you dare criticize us when we want to go by something other than reason. And this is in part also that you have to have reverence for the supernatural. Even if you don't actually think there's such a thing and so on, it's again, it's, yeah, but we take it really seriously that there's some other dimension that doesn't work like this dimension and, and causality doesn't work there and things aren't what they are there. And so, and it sort of exists and doesn't exist. And it's exempt from everything in the natural world. That's what the supernatural really means. And yeah, you might not think there's such things, but again, don't criticize us and don't even say that, that it, there's, something morally like why are you orienting yourself to this whole fantasy realm it's a, it's rather no you have to have reverence for this even if you don't believe it and that is i view one of the ways that i put faith is what the appeal of faith is it's a get out of reason free card it's if you say oh yeah no here i'm just going to be illogical and who cares about the evidence and so on then people will look at you like well, there's something wrong with what you're doing. But if you say, no, here I just want faith, because people have much too much respect for religion, then it's, oh, okay, well, this is his faith. And so, and we, we shouldn't attack that, and even you should respect it. I mean, that's part of what he's pleading for. Um, and even maybe not even just respect, you should revere someone like this. It puts it, this is it's the get out of reason free card, that there's no ramific, no negative ramifications for saying to hell with the evidence and argument i'm going to believe what i want to believe um and that is it is true that ayn rand is saying and is saying in atlas shrugged that is the wrong way to function and wrong meaning there's something evil if that's what you want to do um and that's what they're picking up um, and I think for sure Chambers is picking up and part of what he's responding to. I, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about the Jonah Goldberg podcast when I heard it is, so this is what triggered me, if I can use that expression. What, what actually just, it, it got me really uh, react, a strong reaction. And I thought about what it was. And part of the reaction I had to this, taking it as a whole, just zooming out a little bit from some of the specific comments we've had, is that having heard this, I, mean, I, I wasn't under the impression that he was a fan of Ayn Rand. It never occurred to me. I didn't, I've never seen evidence that he might be, but the, the vehemence of his reaction, the, the reasons he's given, such as they are, and taking this as a whole, what, what struck me was that how embarrassing it is how intellectually embarrassing it is that this is how he reacts to a, a philosopher of Ayn Rand's stature that to me it's it's a fundamentally anti-intellectual approach to the world 
and I think his reaction to Ayn Rand is, a, is just a concrete under that. It's an example of this anti-intellectualism where, you know, you, you gave, I, I really like that expression. It's a, it's a faith is a get out of reason free card. It, to me, when we look at the world today and the many manifestations of how reason is shaping our lives for good and all the wonderful things that we've experienced since the industrial revolution, the scientific revolution, there, it's just there's an endless number of things that you can look at and say this exists only because somebody engaged with the facts and they thought about it and they gained knowledge and they put in the work to do that and they created an, a vaccine to save lives or they created a, an automobile they created an airplane the, the, the computer systems that we're using right now millions of things in our lives that we just uh, take for granted but are all the products of the human mind engaging with reality and learning uh, learning and creating knowledge and creating values that enable our lives to, to be so much so rich and, and so so wonderful and to 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 harp on this one thing where i want this realm in the world where i can have my wishes i can have my supernaturalism and not only can i have it i shouldn't feel guilty about it and this is you should revere this part of my life, that I want a little uh, enclave protected from the reality of what the world really is like, and this is what I want. And, and you can have different perspectives on that, but if you're an intellectual of someone like, like Goldberg's stature, this is embarrassing. This is really... Uh, uh, so. It, it's thumbing your nose at the source of human values. I think that to me, that's part of what uh, I reacted to in this. It's hard. It, it, I'm sure I'll continue reading some of his things because he's he's an interesting person. But I just have much less respect for him now, seeing this aspect of the anti-intellectualism that I think is reflected in his comments on on Rand and the insistent rejection there. I had the same reaction to the whenever i hear hear appeals to tradition i have the reaction that it this is superficially intellectual if it's coming from an intellectual it's superficially intellectual you're you're ready to think but you will stop at a certain point so that it's anti-intellectual another way of looking at it is it's anti-philosophical it will do some thinking but there's pockets and particularly on fundamental issues that it just will not touch and it dares not go there. And that's then an intellectual doesn't fear reality and doesn't fear questioning assumptions all the way down. So it's anti-intellectual. It's and but another perspective on that is anti-philosophical. And it's on on many of these arguments, it's you get a false alternative that's a caricature. So the it's not history's unimportant, what happened in the past, who cares? No, you can learn from history. You can learn from what happened in the past. But that's not slavish obedience to traditions and to what ancestors did and so on. So even in science, and if you brought up the, the creation of the vaccines, they're building on knowledge of the past and past vaccines that have worked. And so a lot of scientific knowledge, but also venturing into the new, and maybe there's new ways of developing vaccines. I mean, this one they developed basically in a weekend, the modern, the, the Pfizer Moderna approach. And that's, if they were tradition bound, you would never have got that. But the alternative is not to hell with everything that happens in the past. We're not gonna learn from anybody who's done anything, who cares what Newton did and so on. That's not the proper attitude, but that's the sort of the way it's presented as to, to try to make it semi-sensible that when we talk about tradition and so there's something right about that, but it's essentially wrong and it's essentially anti-intellectual. So we've I think gotten quite a lot of comments and sorry, let me just uh, mention that. And thank you all on the super chat for your support. I want to recognize that. I'm not sure we'll get to all the questions, but I want to make sure you know, you can just jump into Clubhouse when we finish. We'll be, we'll be moving over there to take a uh, conversation on and we'll, we'll be happy to take your questions if we don't get to them here. But uh, let me give it back to you. Did you want to add another point? I want to just say one thing about this as both kind of a test 
for being a conservative, writing Ayn Rand out of the movement, and what the history has been from, so say from 1957, Whitaker Chambers review and tossing Ayn Rand out of conservatism and more and more defining conservatism as it's essentially religious. The someone like Goldberg, and I think at a certain level sincerely opposes Trump, but what has happened, and in part because this is the direction in which the conservative movement went, we're in a much more religious period than we were in in the 50s. And that's on both sides. So I don't think you understand the Trump phenomenon if you don't see him as a religious figure, as he's an authority whose pronouncements we're going to accept on faith, just like Catholics accept the pronouncements of the Pope on faith. And it doesn't matter if he gives us any evidence. It doesn't matter if what he says defies the evidence before us. We will still believe it and do not criticize us for doing that. This is respectable. Indeed, maybe you should even revere us for doing this. And something like QAnon that has arisen around Trump and him as a, as a kind of religious figure People think of it as crazy. This is what religions look like in their inception. When you read about the, I mean, when you read about a, a fairly modern one, the Mormons, or you read about early Christianity, it's this kind of cult-like figure. And so, and if if one doesn't think that in making and arguing for, we have to have respect for religion and even reverence, that this isn't a consequence of that, no matter how much Goldberg might oppose Trump, that this is a consequence of Buckley, not, I wouldn't ascribe so much causal significance just to him, but the whole direction. And it's on both sides. Like, I think the best critics and interpreters of kind of the woke phenomenon rightly see it as it's a religious mentality. And this is what the world looks, the more you take religion seriously, the, and think it, it deserves respect, reverence, shouldn't be criticized. This is what you're going to get. And no matter how much you protest, the, in, if this is philosophically what you're doing, the, the consequence is inevitable. You can change direction if you're willing to think philosophically about it. But if you're not willing to think philosophically, you can bemoan it all you want, and it's still what you will get. To, to your point about the climate today being more religious than it was in the past. One of the points Ayn Rand makes in her criticisms of conservatism throughout, up, up to and including the 1980s when she commented on uh, Reagan, uh, the incoming Reagan administration, was that it was giving more salience to religion over time and that that becomes really manifest under Reagan. And that for her, this was a symptom of its intellectual bankruptcy and in, one of the points she makes, and this is, again, there's so many points she makes in passing, but if you pause on them and you really think about the, sort of the implications, there's so much there. There's, there's, there's probably a book on that you could spin out of this, but she makes the point that the more that, this is back in the 60s, the more that conservatism stresses religion and makes it, identifies itself with religion and, and associates capitalism with religion or what people think of as capitalism and the defense of it, the religion, it will drive away the more active-minded, the more ambitious, the more scientific, the more rational people who want answers and reasons and, and arguments, not just authority. And I think that what we're seeing today is, I think, both a, a further confirmation of her analysis, that this is the direction conservatism is going and it, it would be destructive, and that's certainly been true, and I think it's also true that there are people who are who feel like they're intellectually homeless because there, wherever you look, there's either tribalism or kind of religious phenomena on the left or on the, whatever they, they think of themselves, the woke, and then on the conservatism. And I think that it, it's I think it has driven better people away, and the, the sort of people you do see, it, it's I can understand why someone would think well. I can't take this seriously. What is there here to take seriously? Um, so, 
let's let's um let's wrap this up. I, I think we we do have a number of questions. I'm not sure we'll fit them in. But what I want to do is take um, a moment. We're a little bit over time, but I think it's worth taking a moment here and playing you a clip of uh, a Q and A portion from Ayn Rand. So this is after her lecture in 1972, Nations Unity at the Ford Hall Forum. And she was asked about uh, any similarities between you and Will, William F. Buckley. And I think, why don't we end with this, uh, with her comments on this question? Because I think it, it, it brings up a lot of the themes that we've been talking about. So let's play that clip. What differences other than atheism and religion do you have with William Buckley, Jr.? <laughs> May I, I will have to answer you speaking this way because well, I can't turn my well, he head can, he on can the mic. Well, he can hear you. He can hear you. It would be simpler if you ask me what similarity do we have, <laughs> and I would say none. A difference such as reason versus mysticism is so much more fundamental, if one can use the term, it affects so much more than politics that politics isn't even important in that context. The first issue is reason versus irrationality, mysticism, faith, and an organized faith. The next reason <laughs> is morality, after which you can come to politics. Now, Mr. Buckley, and I, I, I assume you mean the whole conservative movement, which he represents. They advocate religion and an organized religion, a religion which in its past history and present attempts, it's very interested in politics. In other words, what they have in mind is a theocracy, a society ruled by religious functionaries, which we haven't had since pre-Middle Ages. It's one of the most primitive uh, society there is, like ancient Egypt, is an example of theocracy. The union of uh, Catholic Church and state in the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance, uh, which was responsible for the Inquisition, is an example of theocracy. The view that man is a low-grade, helpless sinner and worm, that the life on earth is a I don't know, a den of iniquity or a veil of tears or whatever they call it. <laughs> and the idea that man must not aspire to solve his problems by using his mind, which is what they accuse the liberal movement of the 19th century, which isn't the same as today, when man liberal movement really stood for individual rights, freedom, and free enterprise. Uh, and they, the uh, Catholic conservative uh, well, thinkers, uh, say <laughs> that man should not attempt to solve social or earthly problems by means of reason. That's why we failed, because the uh, liberals of the 19th century tried to go by nothing, but oh, they used the expression, the arrogance of reason. We should all bow to the Pope and act on faith, and the Pope is the one who has declared that capitalism is worse than Marxism. And of course, the only morality is the morality of altruism, where it is our duty to sacrifice uh, for the good of others and the glory of God. What is there in common between that and me? <laughs> So there you have it, uh, her own perspective from 1972 on the, the fundamental uh, divide. Uh, Ankar, any final thoughts before we wrap up? I'm, I'm not hearing you, sorry. Sorry, um, no, I think it's good to let Ayn Rand have the last word. Sure. Okay, so let me, thanks for joining us all today. We're gonna move to Clubhouse in just a moment. And uh, we hope you'll be here uh, with us next time. So Clubhouse, we're going to continue the conversation. I know there are a lot of questions. We'll try to get to some of those 
uh, on the on that platform. You can find us in the Ayn Rand Club, uh, which is easy to find. And if you enjoyed today's broadcast, um, let me tell you about one resource before I tell you about today's uh, uh, broadcast. So I mentioned the two pieces in this book, Essays on Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, which you can find uh, on Amazon and other places. We have a, a short URL for you here, bit.ly slash essays hyphen atlas. And there you can find uh, Leonard Peikoff's response to the National Review piece by Whitaker Chambers, which was unpublished, but it's included in this book and an essay by Michael Berliner looking at different reviews of Atlas Shrugged, which includes commentary on the Chambers piece, which we discussed today. Um, and uh, I think the other thing I wanted to tell you, we'll be here next week. We'll have a new topic. I hope to see you there. And if you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, whatever platform, please like, share, uh, subscribe, ring the bell so that you get notifications and help us uh, amplify the message in this video and reach more people by uh, taking advantage of these uh, algorithm and in inciting tools. If you have any suggestions or comments, you can send them to us, newideal at aynrand.org. We read everything, we try to respond to some, and often we are uh, inspired to select topics from the questions we receive, so we welcome those suggestions too. So until next time, thank you for being with us. Goodbye. <laughs>